and welcome to week 11, lecture 2 of CO442642 Graph Theory. Today we'll be discussing large girth and large chromatic number. So let's start with large chromatic number and triangle free. Here's the question. Do there exist triangle free graphs of arbitrarily large chromatic number? The answer is yes. And this was proved independently by a number of researchers, starting with Tut in 1947, Zikoff in 49, Michalski in 55, and then others uh, later on with other constructions. Today we'll be doing the Michalski construction. So here's how it goes. So I'll give you an explicit construction of how to build triangle free graphs of large chromatic number. So generally we'll take a graph G on N vertices and enumerate the vertices V1 up to Vn. And then the Michalski graph uh, G prime based off of G is the following. The vertices will be the vertices of G with that labeling V1 up to Vn. And then V1 prime up to Vn prime, those are new vertices. And one last new vertex called V0. The edges will be the original edges plus the edges vi prime vj, where vi vj is an original edge of g, and then we'll put an edge from that special vertex v0 to all the vi primes. So you can study that and pause, but I'll have a picture in a second of an example. So here's that example. Let g be c5, so I'll label the vertices v1, v2, v3, v4, v5. Then here's the Michalski graph. We'll start by making those extra copies. So you should think of the prime as kind of twins of the original, but with no edges between them. So V1 prime is adjacent to V5 and V2, V2 prime is adjacent to V1 and V3, and so on. And then I have to add in one last vertex, this V0, which is adjacent to all kind of all the new vertices, all the primes there. So that's the Michalski construction. And what can you prove about it? Well, one thing to notice is that if the original graph G is triangle free, then so is G prime, the new graph. To see that, I mean, if the original graph didn't have triangles, where would this new triangle be? Well, you'll notice that V0, it does not contain V0 as its neighborhood's an independent set. And what about the primes? Well, they only go to the uh, neighbors of, you know, VI, if it's VI prime, the neighbors of VI, which is an independent set, and then V0 is also independent from those. So they also have independent neighborhoods, and hence the graph is triangle free. More interestingly, though, is that the chromatic number of G prime is now actually gone up, that it's chi of G plus one. So why is that? You might wanna pause and, and think a moment and try to convince yourself uh, as an exercise, but it's a little bit hard, so I'm gonna walk you through it. But first you should convince yourself it is actually equal, uh, is at most that number, because you could color the original graph with chi of G, take that coloring and apply it also to the primes, and then give V zero the new color, the chi plus one. But the, so the real trick is, why is it, uh, you know, at least that? So why can't you color with chi of G colors? So let's go through that argument. Let phi be a chi of G coloring of G prime. With that loss of generality, you can assume by permuting colors that phi of V0 is that last color, chi of G. Then what does that tell you? It tells you that the colors of the primes, those neighbors of V0, aren't chi of G, so they have to live in chi of G minus 1. And then the trick is, if this worked, we can now build a, a better coloring of the original graph. How does that go? We'll let phi prime of vi be either uh, phi of vi prime, so the, the color of its twin, if the color phi of vi was chi of g. And we'll let it be phi of vi otherwise. So the trick is, you know, we have this, this decent coloring, but we can do a bit better by taking that extra color, the chi g, and saying, oh, we don't need it, we'll give those ones their twin color. And this doesn't create any problems because chi, the vertices colored chi of g form an independent set. So you can't take the coloring and project it for all vertices, but you can do it for an independent set, and then that won't have any new conflicts. And so then you'd get a chi of g minus one coloring of g, and that is a contradiction. All right, so that's the proof for the Michalski graph, and it's just a nice construction, and there are other constructions by Tut, by Zikoff, even by others, uh, for creating arbitrarily large, right? Because the idea is, for the Michalski, is you just iterate this. So if you start with C5, then you get this new graph, chi becomes four, you repeat it again, and chi becomes five, and so on, and it always stays triangle-free, and you get arbitrarily large chromatic number.
But the main topic we'll be talking about today is not that, but rather the more general question, do there exist graphs of arbitrarily large girth and large chromatic number? Remember girth being the size of the shortest cycle, the length of the shortest cycle in the graph. So if we have large girth, we're not only forbidding triangles, but four cycles, five cycles, etc. So can we forbid all short cycles and still force, still have large chromatic number? So it was not clear whether the answer to this question it was yes or no, I and mean, even the triangle free was a bit of a surprise, but people thought maybe this one was not true, but it turns out it is. And this was actually proved by Erdos using the probabilistic method. So they, that idea of using probability to construct things uh, that we learned last class, he used that now to, to solve this question. So more specifically, in 1959, he showed that for every r at least one, there's a graph of girth at least r and chromatic number at least r. And I, I will mention though that that's it's probabilistic method, and we'll we'll give the proof today and go through that. But this only shows that there exist such graphs. You know that if you do some kind of random process, you're you're likely to to kind of get such a graph, or it's possible to. Uh, it doesn't actually tell you explicitly how to construct them, right? It's more of an existence proof, and that's natural for using the probabilistic method. So if you actually want to point, you know, tell me which one is it, uh, then that's harder. And that was only first done by Lovas in uh, 1968, so about nine years later, giving a first explicit construction of such graphs. But we won't do that. We'll, we'll use, so the, use the probabilistic method to show that they in fact exist at least. All right, so to do that, we're going to need to go over some basic facts about probability. So I, mentioned, I alluded to some of these in the previous lecture. Let's go over them. One is the union bound, that the probability if you have different events, so here are the A's are, are events in a probability space, and the probability of A1 union A2 union AK is a, at most the sum of the probabilities of the AIs. So if you want to take the probability of a union of events at most their sum. That's called the union bound. Another standard thing is expectation, which you should know. Here it will say if x is a random real valued variable with finite support, then the expectation of x is e of x, that's how we denote it, and it's equal to the sum over the i of i times the probability that x is equal to i. So you take the average, that's the expectation. Uh, if it was had infinitely many variables, this would lead more to an integral, and then you'd have to think about integral considerations, uh, but we'll be just studying finite variables, so that will be fine. So that's expectation, and then there's a fundamental property known as the linearity of expectation, that if x is equal to uh, some, if x is a random variable that's the sum of other random variables, then we think of it then it turns out the expectation of x is simply the sum of the expectations of the xi. The expectation acts linearly, uh, kind of as an operator. So you should be able to believe that just from the definition. You, you can kind of write uh, a double sum and, and rearrange it, and, and then you get this formula. So that's the linearity of expectation. Then where do we go from there? We're going to need one more thing, which is a concentration inequality. And what is that? We're going to use the most basic one. So in general, and we don't have time to talk about this, concentration inequalities are inequalities where you want to bound the probability that a, uh, a variable is far from its expectation. And the most basic form is called Markov's. So how does this work? If x is at least zero, that means it's a non-negative random variable, that it's always non-negative for all of its outcomes. Then for any a greater than zero, the probability that x is at least a is at most the expectation of x divided by a. So what you should think there is, you know, what's the probability that you're kind of, say, say you had a be twice the expectation, then that's at most half. So if you're going to be many times the expectation, if you're non-negative random variable, that becomes more and more unlikely. And this follows from a simple counting argument, but we'll go through. By definition of expectation, e of x is, is this sum. And since x is non-negative, well, we can throw out all the lower terms when i is smaller than a since those will be only positive things. Uh, so we know that e of x is at least the sum of the i greater than or equal to a of i times the probability of x equal i. All those i's are at least a, so I can lower bound that by a times the sum of the probability x equals i for i at least a, which is simply, of course, the probability that x is at least a. And then if you divide both sides by a, you get the desired inequality. So that's a proof of Markov's.
So we're going to need Markov's today to prove uh, Erdos's theorem. So let's go through how that will work. So I'll remind you uh, of what we learned last class about random graphs. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be using random graphs to try to create this construction uh, to show that they exist. So G and P, remember, is the random graph on n vertices where every edge is present independently with probability P. And last class, we did two things. We showed, essentially, remember that the probability that G and P has a KK is at most N choose K, P to the K choose 2. And that was kind of by simple union bound counting. A different way to say that, which is how I written it here, is the probability that the clique number of G and P is at least K, is at most that number. Similarly, we applied it also the same argument to the complement to show that uh, you don't contain large independent sets with high, you know, that it's low probability you would contain a large independent set. A different way to say that is the probability that alpha, the independence number of G and P is at least K, is N choose K, but now we use the probability of the non-edge, which is one minus P to the K choose two. So again, pause, you can go back to the previous video and go through those, but we'll just use, actually we don't need the first fact about the cliques, we're just gonna need the one about independence number as that will relate to coloring and chromatic number. Okay, so those are the things we needed from, from last class. Now we can do a little bit more on the independence number. So more specifically, I claim that if P is at least four log N over K and K is at least two, then the probability that alpha is at least K for G and B is at most one over N, which is quite tiny. So let's do this proof. So proof, uh, and again, you could work it through yourself, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through it for you. So the key is that one minus P can be upper bounded by E to the minus P for all P. Uh, and that e to the p choose k minus 1 is at least uh, e to the pk over 2, uh, which is at least e, uh, at least n squared, right? So these numbers will come up, so k is at least 2, so k minus 1 is at least k over 2, and then if you put in that value of p, you'll find that comes out to be at least n squared. So then we can just use the previous lemma where we upper bounded with n choose k 1 minus p uh, to the k choose 2, so then if you know that n choose k is upper bounded by say n to the k, and we know one minus p is at most e to the minus p, we get that that value is at, least, at most n to the k times e to the minus p k choose two. Now if I extract a k from all of those exponents, we get that it's n over e to the p k minus one to the k power. Uh, and now what we learned was that e to the p k minus one is at least n squared, so you get n over n squared, that becomes one over n, and 1 over n to the k is certainly at most 1 over n as desired. So that's, that's that proof. So it's kind of saying, you know, if p is kind of a log n over k, then actually the probability that alpha is at least k is quite small. It's at most 1 over n. So you're, you're actually rather unlikely to have such kind of large independent sets, independent sets of size kind of 4 log n over p. Okay, right. So that's saying like, so if, for example, if p is a half, then that would give you, uh, you know, you want to have independent sets of more than like 8 log n, uh, for example, uh, which is what we used to do Ramsey numbers kind of last time. But here we're going to need it more generally because we're not going to be p to be a half uh, or even actually constant. We'll use a function of n, uh, and so we'll need this more uh, gradated approach. All right, so that's what we need about independence number. That's going to be useful for coloring. And then we need to do talk about cycles, right? So we have to think about girth and about short cycles. So let hashtag or number there, CLG, denote the number of cycles L in a graph G. And then I'm going to also need kind of the following factorial NL, which is N, N minus 1, dot, 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 N minus L plus 1, which you should be used to, N factorial over L factorial, equivalently. And here's the key lemma, is we can actually calculate the expected number of cycles of length L in GNP. And I claim it's the following factorial of L over 2L times P to the L. So if you want an exercise, again, you could pause the video and, and try to prove this to yourself, but I'm gonna give you the proof. And again, all of this is in distal, so you can go read that as well. But here it's actually quite simple. You just consider how the sequences are, go. So you kind of do a, a counting. So let v1, v2, vl be a sequence in v of g of length l. So that's kind of a potential cycle of length l. And I'm thinking of it as a sequence because I want to think of uh, the cycle as a sequence of vertices. So then what's the probability that v1 to vl is a cycle, that there are all those edges are present? Well, those are all independent, so it's exactly p to the l would be the probability that those l edges are all present. 
And then we just have to compare how these sequences correspond to cycles. There are n choose, you know, n following factorial such sequences. That's how you pick a sequence, n and z minus one choices and so on. Well, each cycle corresponds to exactly 2L of these sequences. Why is that? Well, you can pick a starting vertex, there's L of those, and then a direction for a cycle. There's two directions. So there's 2L uh, such sequences for a given cycle in the graph. And so then we divide by that and we find this expectation. So uh, falling factorial then L over 2L, P to the L. And so the hope is, you know, if uh, P is small, then this number will be quite uh, small. And so then if we could use Markov, say, to, to bound the probability that you don't have too many of them. All. So let's go through how that works. So here's a corollary. If we have P is it small, so here I'll use at most n to the 1 over 2L minus 1, then I claim the expected number of cycles of length L is at most 1 over root n, uh, which is quite small. So that's a, a typo there. It should be that, uh, sorry, not 1 over root n, but should be root n. So how does that work? Then by the lemma, uh, the expected number of cycles is nL over 2 to the L, p to the L. Forget about that 2 to the L on bottom. So that's in most uh, np to the L. Also n falling factorial L, you can upper bound by n to the L. So you get np to the L, and then the claim is that that's you know, equal, uh, or rather at most, again, sorry, it's typo there, uh, is at most uh, square root of n. And that just follows. If you times that inequality by both sides by n, you get n to the 1 over 2L for np to the L, that's n to the 1 half. So that's our, our, our corollary about cycles, that the expected number, which again, sorry about that, should be most square root n. Then let hashtag uh, c less than or equal L of g denote the number of cycles of length at most n. Because that's what we're really interested. We kind of upper bounded for each specific one, let's take all of them together, all the short cycles. Then the corollary is uh, the probability, if I now I'll actually set p to be n to the 1 over 2l minus 1, say, then the probability that the uh, number of cycles of length at most l exceeds n over 2 is actually quite small. It's l over 2 root n. And the proof here is just Markov's inequality. So why is that? Well, for each cycle length, there's a most root n of them, so there's a most kind of l root n, and so then if we take that and apply Mar Markov, so you take n over 2 uh, and kind of comparing that to l root n, so you take l root n, you divide by n over 2, you get this, uh, this upper bound. Uh, but I think the, the, sorry, the 2 should be in the top there. All right, so then that cycle's uh, continued. We've gotten, gotten a, a probability for the upper bound there. Now, how are we going to proceed? The key is I need to introduce to you a new method. So what's the new method? It's called alteration. The key insight is there is actually no P that gives us both. So you can't just pick a magical P and try to hope for no short cycles and also uh, small or large, and also hope for a high chromatic number. So that's what this says, that we can't hope to get both that say the probability that chi of GNP is say less than or equal to R is small, say less than a half, and that the probability GMP does not have growth at least R is also small, say less than a half, and then use the union bound to get the thing. So there's no one magic P that has GNP having both of these properties. So, because that's why is that? Well, kind of for the cycle case, we need P to be quite small to avoid any cycles. Uh, for the other case, you need P to be kind of large, and those windows don't overlap. So what do we do? We use a method called alteration, which is quite useful and it's now standard in probabilistic methods. And it goes like this. Alteration is, you know, we're going to take a random outcome, this random procedure. So think GNP, and maybe it doesn't give us exactly what we want. We deterministically then alter that random outcome so as to obtain the desired object of the graph, you know, the, the graph that we want. So how does this work in practice? And we'll see it in a second for this problem. So the idea here is that GNP, you know, is kind of maybe likely if we pick the right P to satisfy that first condition, maybe it doesn't have the girth one, but maybe there aren't too many, uh, too many short cycles. And so if we could just delete those, we could hopefully keep the chromatic number high while also getting rid of all the short cycles. So we could alter the outcome. So we'll kind of take GNP, it doesn't quite have what we want, but we'll alter it a bit in a deterministic fashion fashion to uh, obtain the desired outcome.
So let's see that in practice. So here's the proof of Eridocious theorem, assuming those earlier lemmas. Let L be R minus one and P be N to the one over two L minus one. So we're trying to, again, exclude those cycles of length at most R minus one. So it's natural to take P to be that value. So by our cycle lemma, then uh, you'd have this probability for the number of cycles being at least N over two is quite small. And now what do we do? Well. I have to tell you what to do for the independence number lemma, so let k be n over 2r, and you'll see why that instead of n over r in a second. And note that k is at least true, and that the probability uh, p, which was defined above, is at least for log n over k if n is large enough, right? So if n is large enough compared to r, then certainly k is at least true. And what about the p there? Well, p is kind of, you know, it's n to the 1 over 2l over n. Whereas the desired p we need for the independence number lemma there is log n over, over k, which is roughly n as well. So it'll work out in our favor if n is large enough. So let me not tell you what n to work, but it's clear a large enough n will do that. So by the independence number lemma, we have that the probability that alpha is at least k is in most 1 over n as uh, p, satisfied those, p and k satisfied those inequalities that we needed. So we're almost done. The point is you put these together uh, and get that, you know, L over root N plus one over N, I mean, L's fixed. So again, if N is large enough, uh, those will be quite small, much smaller than a half. And so together, much smaller than one. And what does that mean? That means that there exists some graph that has both outcomes. So let's put that together, right? This is the probabilistic method. We know that G there is a GNP, there is a, an outcome. So there is a graph G on N vertices with alpha at most n over 2r, uh, and at most n over 2 cycles of length less than r. So we can get that the independence number is small, avoiding those large independent sets, and there aren't too many short cycles. So there are most n over 2 short cycles. Now we apply alteration. So how does that work? Well, we're going to get rid of those cycles. So for each cycle c of length at most r, just choose some vertex, call it xc in v of c. Now what do we do? We take x to be the union of all these vertices we've chosen. And again, that was just arbitrary choice, and we delete them. So basically we just delete one vertex from, a, from each cycle. Uh, and then what do we get? Well, now think about this graph g prime. What are its properties? Number one, it has girth at least r. We got rid, we, you know, we destroyed all of the cycles of length less than r. There weren't too many of them, so we could just go ahead and destroy them. Now, what we also have, though, is that we haven't lost too many vertices. V of G prime is at least N over 2, because we got rid of it most N over 2 vertices. And thus, we have now, what about the independence number? Alpha of G prime is, of course, at most alpha of G. If I take a subgraph, I don't have a larger independence set. Alpha of G was N over, at most N over 2 R by assumption. And then if we plug in our bound on V of G prime, we see that's at most V of G prime over R. So this is why we chose N over 2 R instead of kind of n over r to account for the fact that we need v of g prime will be smaller. So importantly, we get that alpha of g prime is at most v of g prime over r. Why is that good? Well, again, stop and think about that for a moment. What does this say about the chromatic number? Well, the claim is that the chromatic number is then at least r as desired. Why? Well, alpha is at most, you know, v of g prime over r. So any color class can only use a most an rth of the vertices, a one over r fraction of the vertices. So we need at least r color classes to cover all the vertices. So the chromatic number must be at least r. So that's why we ended up working with independence number kind of instead of chromatic number, because we can't kind of know whether or not the chromatic number uh, would be preserved if we delete vertices, but we know the independence number is. So we keep the independence number small, delete, and then that will kind of keep the chromatic number high as long as you don't lose too many. And we can do that by deleting, doing this alteration on the short cycles. And we got there by using uh, Markov's inequality and calculating the expectation. So it's quite a nice proof. Uh, things go into it. You know, you have to choose your P correctly. You kind of want it small, but not too small. And so we ended up having to do, uh, pick the right P to get that to work. But that's a taste of the probabilistic method. Uh, and a taste of alteration, a more advanced kind of version of it uh, to prove what seemingly is quite a, a structural problem, you know, the existence of graphs of large growth and large chromatic number. So until next time, see you then.